Welcome to the Proactive Security Podcast with Mike Hodges and Brian Hamilton. This podcast is dedicated to discussing violence prevention in healthcare. We want to inform, equip, and empower healthcare security leaders to prevent violence before it happens. And now, here's your hosts, Mike and Brian. Hey, everybody, I'm Mike. And I'm Brian. And this is episode 17 of the Proactive Security Podcast. We have got some very special guests with us today, Brian. Yes, we do. Today, we're joined by Jim Brophy and Margaret Keith, who are husband and wife team who are tackling workplace violence. So doing a lot of the work that definitely that we appreciate that we're engaging in ourselves. But Margaret and, and, uh, and Jim, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks oh, thank you. Us. We are incredibly excited to have you both. You know, as we were talking before the podcast, I, I mentioned uh, to you how excited I am to see just the breadth of work you've done and just the advocacy uh, you have kind of uh, lifted up in relation to making people aware about the reality of violence against healthcare workers. Can, can you just tell us how you got interested in this topic or how you got connected to this topic? Well, First of all, thank you both for, for doing the work that you're doing. I mean, I think we're very much, you know, focusing together on a very important issue, which is the almost uncontrolled and literally little understood and, and known uh, occurrence of violence in healthcare. Um, Margaret and I have been working in occupational health for almost four decades. We did a lot of work uh, assisting workers with chemicals and cancer and asbestos and, you know, all the things that are generally, you know, known about occupational health. But in 2015, we were asked by the Ontario Council of Hospital Unions, OCHU, to start to look at the issue of violence. They had held a conference of nurses in their union. They, they represent close to 40,000 healthcare workers in Ontario. And this was a conference of about 150 nurses, and every single one had been physically assaulted. Everyone at the conference, which was a very big shock to the union. They had no idea how extensive all of this was. And that started us down a path. And then they asked Margaret and I if we would do a study looking at violence in hospitals. Uh, and in 2017, we published that study. And I, I should just say, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop, but um, we did this study by doing extensive interviews and focus groups with healthcare workers throughout Ontario. And after a session, we would have like in the groups, there could be six to eight people, even a fewer sometimes. And Marg and I would sit after everybody left and talk to each other about what we had heard because we were asking people to talk to us about their work experience. And we were horrified. And we didn't know why we didn't know this. And I think that was something that had a profound effect on us. How was such a blatant occupational health, human rights issue so underreported and so uh, kept at the margins that even people like ourselves with decades of occupational health experience were completely unaware of it. And I guess we consider ourselves to be advocacy researchers. I mean, we, we do this research because we wanna make a difference. We, we understood that there was a need to look into this problem. We didn't really grasp the enormity of it until we started doing the research. But you know, we, we feel that it's important when you do research that you speak out afterwards about it. There's so much research gets done and just gets put into a peer reviewed journal and sits on a dusty shelf. Well, you know, that doesn't do any good. We wanted to make sure that we would get the word out. As Jim said, we were completely thrown by this. We were almost embarrassed that with all of our experience in occupational health, we were so unaware of how much violence there was, type two violence, which is violence against the staff from the clients, the patients, family members, so on. That's what we were really looking at. And, you know, you, we would hear the odd story in the media that would be the other way around where some healthcare worker had been caught abusing someone in long-term care or whatever. That's what was 
And when we started talking to people about it, they'd say, oh yeah, I read that story or whatever. I mean, that statistically is like nowhere compared to the violence against the healthcare workers from the patients, the residents, the family members and so on. So once we started hearing about this, we knew we had to speak out about it. And one of the things I think that shocked me the most, maybe as a, a woman, was how this thing was kept secret. These, these, the majority of the healthcare workers, what 85% are women, um, many of them racialized, and they're being told to be quiet about this. They're not allowed to speak publicly about it. If they do speak publicly, they end up being fired. We knew of several situations here in Ontario where that happened. And so even when we were doing our research, we had people very reticent to speak out. We made sure that everybody was protected, that their anonymity was protected. Um, every, you know, when we wrote the book, when we wrote up the articles, we didn't say where people were from, even, you know, I mean, their, their names, anything that might identify them, we changed slightly to protect them because this was a real danger. Why were these people being told that they just had to put up with violence and not speak out about it. So of course, as I say, as a woman, to me, it just was so characteristic of violence against women and racialized people. You know, you're expected to put up and shut up and you're not gonna get anywhere. I, I actually, I wanna read to you a little quote that we had put into the book. This was actually written by, in a book by Rebecca Solnit, but she was saying, you know, we all have to be able to talk openly about this, we, you know, for our psychological health and also to get anything changed. So she, she says, you know, we need to be able to talk openly about such issues as violence, fear, discrimination, and burnout. Unfortunately, the silencing of healthcare workers about violence on the job makes it difficult for them to reach out to anyone other than perhaps coworkers or whatever about what they're experiencing. So Rebecca Solnit, who wrote a book about the silencing of women as a form of control, said, being unable to tell your story is a living death. Violence against women is often against our voices and our stories. Silence is what allowed predators to rampage through the decades unchecked. Having a voice is crucial. It's not all there is to human rights, but it's central to them. And so you can consider the history of women's rights and lack of rights as a history of silence and of breaking silence. And I think that this is what you're doing with the work that you're doing, what we're trying to do is to break the silence. The public has a right to know, the, the healthcare workers have a right to speak out about what their workplace conditions are like. Absolutely. I'm kind of sitting in, in the power of that particular quote and uh, thinking about that in terms of how often we do run into just kind of this wall of you know, maybe we have some vague awareness, but we don't engage with that awareness if we do have it. And a lot of times we don't even have an awareness uh, that this is an issue within the industry. And it's, it's systemic. It's not just uh, in Canada or the United States. It is a global issue, uh, as we've discussed, um, and has become very endemic to operations within a hospital, uh, which is very, uh, very sad. And, and it is very much a global issue. When we were doing research for the first article, we did a Medline search looking for healthcare workers and violence, nurses and violence and so on. There actually were thousands of articles that had been written across the globe about all of this. But as I say, most of them ended up on a dusty shelf. These were, you know, academic and scientific medical articles that, that were not really advocacy articles, although most of them had recommendations and it was amazing how close the recommendations were from article to article, from country to country. You know, it was all, they, they talked about the reasons for so much violence and why nothing is really happening um, to prevent violence. And um, we heard the same stories when we were talking to people. So I, somehow this thing has gotten so out of control across the globe. There are exceptions. There are some places where they've managed to, to put practices into place that are protective, but in, you know, it, it really is something that everybody needs to be focusing on. Yeah, for sure. And the, the other thing too, that kind of stuck out for me was, you know, you, you talk about some of the, some of the clinical staff being 
you know, being fearful of sharing information just because of the risk of losing their jobs. Now, is that something that you see still happening today? Like I, I know when I, when I looked at some of the information that was out there previously, just based on other work that you've done, I know some of this was older issues, but do you, do you see that still being the case where people are actually in fear of being terminated for speaking out about workplace violence? Oh, I, I, I mean, we know from polling that has been done, for instance, by OCHU, that not only has there been a very substantial increase in violence through the pandemic, I guess that's what you're, you're referring to, right? The last few years, there's been a substantial increase, but also the fear and uh, of reprisal is still very, very much at, at play. And what we are watching in Ontario, and I'm not sure if this is true in the United States, but in Ontario, we're watching, and in across Canada, is that nurses, for instance, are leaving the profession in very high numbers. And, you know, at first glance, it appears that it's just the complete exhaustion and burnout uh, and emotional uh, anxiety caused by two years of dealing with a pandemic. And certainly that has contributed to it. But this has been well in play for a long time. And these conditions, I mean, when we were doing our, our second study, which was looking at long-term care, the percentage of, of people that want, were contemplating leaving their position was not just, we heard it in the focus group, but in polling that was, was done as well, was so substantial. We knew that there was a staffing crisis emerging because people literally were not only worked off their feet, but they were so, they felt so vulnerable and, and fearful that they, they, just, they just couldn't sustain themselves. In one focus group we had, for instance, a nurse who was also the president of the local told us that she had used her seniority to go into dietary because she couldn't take the abuse anymore. This, this was a woman with long seniority, I mean, years of experience that just couldn't do her job anymore. And that's what we're seeing right across uh, the country, right? So yeah, the, 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 all, all the things that we saw and, and heard in our studies, uh, and we did do a, a study on the early part of the pandemic as well, are out there now in full force and people feel no way of addressing these, this crisis other than you know leaving, looking for other work because you know we've suffered from 30 years of defunding and understaffing. And uh, the, so the crisis in healthcare is full blown now. And just to go back to this issue of silencing, the most recent study we did was, was looking at conditions for healthcare workers during the pandemic. And I think it was half of the people that we had scheduled to interview at the last minute said, oh, I can't do it. I'm just too afraid that I'll be found out and I'll, I'll be disciplined or I'll lose my job. So, you know, that's fairly recent. We do know that there are some union leaders who are speaking out, uh, who, you know, who feel safe enough, I guess to be able to do that, but, but it looks like the average healthcare worker has been very intimidated around all this. Uh, the firing of a nurse that, that in uh, North Bay who spoke out had a chilling effect, I think. That, that happened just before we started our first set of interviews around violence and everybody knew about her having been fired for having said to the media, we have a problem of violence in healthcare. She didn't identify where she worked, or any specific conditions, but she dared to say, we have a problem. And she was fired for it. it she finally got her job back at, two years later at great cost to the union and, and uh, you know, a lot of legal costs and so on, but it had, you know, it, it had its, it left its mark. And that, it, what's sad about that is it just exacerbates what's an, you know, already a tragic situation. Right. We just continue to perpetuate the culture that allows for that level of violence to persist. And what I've often found um, shocking is, is when you when you look at the numbers associated with violence against healthcare workers, uh, especially, you know, obviously I'm a little more focused in the United States, but especially within the United States. And my assumption would be it'd be very similar in, in Canada. But when you look at the numbers the numbers are astronomical. You know, statistically speaking, it is an incredibly high numerical count of you know assaults across the board. But uh, because of 
the silencing that you're talking about, and then just because of the cultural acceptance that has crept into the industry as a result of years and years and years of this, you know, persisting as a part of quote unquote part of the job, those numbers as high as they are represent only a fraction of the true reality. Uh, which is which is what blows me away. We've I, you know we've looked at studies out of the CDC uh, where they estimate only one in five incidents are actually ever reported, and uh, of that one in five that's reported, those numbers still put us, you know, our nurses in the United States at a higher likelihood of being assaulted than police officers, and it's incredible. Uh, and so how do we how do we break those cultural issues, whether it's uh, fear of speaking up because of reprisal or cultural acceptance of violence that represses our, you know, desires to, to report or speak up. How do we break those cultural bonds to help us uh, actually address violence against healthcare workers more effectively? You know, maybe just, uh, to, just to say, you know, follow up on what you said about the, the numbers in the U.S. I mean, uh, just to say again, the numbers in Canada are astounding. There's there's no other occupation with anywhere near the levels of violence. In fact, uh, healthcare workers, if you look at compare it to all the other incidents of violence and occurring in all the other occupations, is still two or three times more prevalent when you compare it with everybody else. And when you do it, it's I forget the exact number, but it's two or three times uh, the number of of uh, police and correction officers combined. And that is, as you say, I mean, the reported incidents, which very much underestimate estimate the level of violence, but even looking at compensation statistics, lost time injuries, uh, you know, it's, it's something, yeah, like four times what you would, ex what you would have in other occupations. So even those that are so serious that they end up, you know, with lost, lost time compensation, and there's so many that that don't they're not reported or people just sort of you know limp back into work the next day and and never do file for compensation you know when you ask what can be done about it it's it's not so simple right there's no one solution when we started looking at and talking to people about you know what what do you think is behind all of this it, it's a cultural thing as you say it's a societal thing it it's an institutional, financial, political, you know, there are so many aspects to all of this. But one of the things that came up time and time again was the erosion of the healthcare system. The fact that we have far too few healthcare workers to really do the job, to be able to do it safely, to be able to have two people go in instead of one, if there's someone that is, you know, potentially violent or angry. They, we have so many frustrated people. I was reading an article this morning talking about how, of course, and it's the same thing in Canada and the US now with COVID and Omicron, um, the emergency departments are completely overflowing. So you've got people coming in that are waiting for hours and hours. And I mean, literally 13 hours sometimes sitting in a plastic chair waiting to be seen. Who are they taking it out on? Those few healthcare workers that are there. Um, and it's, it's not the healthcare workers' fault. I mean, we have been allowing our healthcare system to erode. It's a, it's a you know, in Canada where we have universal healthcare, this was something we were always so proud of. And we're old enough that we remember a time when we would go into the ER with a child who had fallen off a bike, get right in, get stitched and be home in 45 minutes. Now, I mean, we had an experience ourselves of waiting for 13 hours to, to get in. And this was before COVID. And, and so it, it, the, the healthcare workers are ending up being victimized by a system that is falling apart. And so until that's taken care of, I, you know, we're not gonna end violence. We also have, of course, you know, societal issues, sexism, racism. And I think there's even this, this idea, it's kind of an entitlement thing or whatever. People come in, they expect to be served and they expect to be served immediately. And if they're not, they take it out on the first person that they see. Um, I mean, there's so, there's so much more to it all, but I mean, I think those, I think in every single interview we did, staffing was, came out as, 
probably the number one issue. Yeah. There are lots of other things. The way work is organized, you know, people don't have um, call bells or they don't have the security alarms, the personal alarms. I mean, we have people who are saying, all I could do is shout, you know, or they're going you know, to be hidden uh, hallways where someone could be could be pushed up against a wall and and no one would know and no one would hear doors that close the wrong way and trap a, a patient in a room. We had Diane Pollan we wrote about in the book. She was working in a, a psychiatric ward of a hospital and went in to tend to a patient alone because the person who had been in there with him went off for dinner. She went in alone. He had been very reactive earlier but seemed to have calmed down. He asked to use the phone. She said, you're gonna to have to wait until the other nurse comes back. Next thing you know, he had her pinned up against the door that had closed and locked itself, had a chair pushing her up against the door, started punching her, hitting her in the face. She was yelling for help. Finally, I think patients on the other side of the door sure. alerted the staff. They were trying to push the door open, couldn't, they had it unlocked, they're pushing it, her, all of her weight and him pushing against it made it very difficult for them to get in. She said she finally just sort of with all her strength pushed back, they were able to get in um, and, and get him, um, I mean, stabilized. He actually calmed down once the rest of the staff came in. She was extremely hurt. She had a concussion. She was bruised everywhere. She ended up losing her teeth. She never was able to go back to nursing. She was so traumatized by this episode and it didn't have to happen. I mean, she could have, you know, if the work design had been different, if there had been adequate staffing, if there could have been two people in there at a time, if there had a, been a better way to contact security or, uh, you know, call a code white, which she wasn't able to do, maybe she wouldn't have been as hurt. Um, there are just so many, parts of that story when she went to get compensation they they said that her post-traumatic stress disorder was related to abuse as a child and she said well I've been nursing for 20 years you know how was I able to do that for 20 years and you're saying now that I've been so badly beaten and you know assaulted. so assaulted um all of a sudden now my PTSD is because of a childhood anyway she had a fight for years around compensation she felt she was being so she was injured, she was assaulted by a patient, and then she felt that she was just being further assaulted. attacked by her, you know, the hospital administration that just dismissed it and the compensation system. You know, it's a compli complicated issue. You know, it, it's interesting as I, as I listen to you talk, there are so many, and, and, and Brian and I have talked a lot about these and, and you know, on the podcast uh, with some other folks and, in the context of our, our healthcare security professional world, there's so many tools available that can legitimately prevent violence. There are things we can do to prevent violence. And you, you mentioned a couple of those things, talking about having two staff in the room, talking about you know, the physical design of a, of a patient care room, talking about there's lots of different things. So there's, there's lots of things we could do. All of those things require investment, right? And that's that's one of the things we bump into all the time is, well, how do we make the business case so we can get the investment needed to provide the protection? And I, as I'm listening to you talk, I'm, I'm thinking about two things. I'm, th I'm thinking about the, the impetus to make the investment and then humanizing that story, right? We, can, we present a lot of numbers. We, we've talked a little bit about numbers. Numbers are out of, the, uh, you know, out of the atmosphere when it comes to the size and scope, but numbers don't necessarily relate that human story is you're telling the stories about, you know, this particular nurse who was assaulted. Uh, I've, I've often told the story about Elise Wilson. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she was an emergency department nurse in Boston who was stabbed 11 times. Uh, she, she went in to treat her patient, turned her back to grab something off the tray, and he started stabbing her almost immediately. Um, and it ended her career. Uh, almost ended her life. Um, but stories like that help us humanize the story of workplace violence in healthcare. But there's so many tangible things we can point to that make it a good, not only right thing to do for the people we're serving in those jobs, but right thing to do for the health and business welfare of the, the organization when it comes to, as you mentioned earlier, reducing turnover, 
you know, increasing employee engagement, productivity, reducing lost and days away from work, you know, all of the things associated with the cost of this. One of the one of the the stats that I've pointed to in the past, if you look at numbers, and there's not there's not good numbers out there, but if you can you can estimate based on numbers from the American Society of Safety Engineers. Uh, and uh, I think the American Nursing Association, it's about a $1.6 billion cost annually to the healthcare industry that we spend on you know, reacting to violent attacks, which is mind-blowing to me because that should be enough of an emphasis, impetus for us from a business standpoint to want to invest in this. Uh, but two, it, it does not account for the human costs associated with that giant dollar figure. So how do we how do we tell that story more effectively and help redirect? I mean, do we have to create public outrage to get somebody to actually do something? Or can we craft a story that's effective at, you know, pointing to the reasons why this is a good decision to invest in the protection of our workers? Well, why you're just raising these very important issues and stuff what was striking me is first of all canada and the united states we we do share some common things for instance we almost always end up in the lowest rungs of healthcare measurements uh compared to uh, all other industrialized country canada smugly thinks they're better because they're just ahead of the united states which just always last uh but in truth uh, Ontario and Canada has the lowest uh, ratio of nurses to patients in almost all the industrialized world. We're the worst. Our province is the worst in Canada. And Canada. And, and Canada. I mean, Ontario is tied with Mexico, I think, in, in terms of a lot of these. Yeah. Which, certainly staffing levels. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the. It's the, all about saving money. Right? right. I mean, this is there have been huge cutbacks. Um, all about austerity. Let's you know do with the least we possibly can, and I, I I don't know why they don't see that you know financially it would make sense to do this. But I mean, going beyond that, I mean, how is the human cost not something that that they should be considering? You know, when you think of what healthcare is, it's about taking care of people. Why are we not taking care of the people who are taking care of people? Mm -hmm. And we are always say that the health of the healthcare workers in many ways is a barometer of the health of our healthcare system. Our healthcare workers are not doing well. And as we all know, during the pandemic, the whole thing has really fallen apart. So in terms of violence, but also protection for healthcare workers, you know, it would, we're not protecting them. We're not providing them with adequate respiratory protection or, you know, the, the, the various engineering controls that could be put in place to protect them from COVID. And I think all of that is just a continuation of the same story. What we were hearing from the workers that we were talking to about the issue of violence and what they thought was behind it all, we, we heard all the same thing when we talked to people about what their experiences were working in healthcare during COVID. It's the same sort of neglect. Systemic. And, yeah. and yeah, so it's lack of caring about the healthcare workers themselves. They're there to do a job, they're to do it. and and. Um, you know, I think it, it does so often come down to the bottom line. And, and I don't know, I don't know how you get to the people who are in charge of the purse strings, how you would convince them that this is something that would pay off. But I, as I say, I think it should go well beyond that. I think we should be really looking at it as a human rights issue, a social justice issue. And I think the only way that's going to happen is you know, as you say, these stories have to get out there. The public needs to know about it. The public needs to be saying, hey, there's something really wrong here. We don't, we don't accept what's happening in healthcare. Because, you know, as I say, the, the, the health of the healthcare workers, if, if it's not um, being protected, then the patients are also at the receiving end of poor care. And, and, and it's all tied in together. I, I just wanted to, to, to say that, you know, looking at Canada and the United States for a second, because it's different. Our health, you know, in the United States, healthcare is pretty much a, a, a private 
operation. You know, the vast majority of people get healthcare through for-profit institutions. Uh, in Canada, uh, you know, since the 1960s, um, we've had this national universal healthcare system, which was, you know, just to say to everybody's, you know, to your audience on both sides of the border, I think it's fair to say that this was considered by Canadians as probably their most prized social program. I mean, it was the social safety net that healthcare provided, and it was a major fight to get it. I mean, it started in Saskatchewan in the 40s, late 40s, you know, went through into the 50s and 60s, and finally, you know, in the, in the 1960s, the federal government set this up after a royal commission. And so this was like a very prized institution. And I think as Margaret was saying earlier, you know, our generation benefited enormously from this. Like, it, I mean, we never thought of, you know, the cost of, of healthcare in a, in a sense, like when we went in with our children, you know, with an injury, it wasn't like, oh my God, can we afford an x-ray or something? And, and I think there was that sense of pride in that institution. And then in the 1980s, you know, with, you know, I want to say with Reagan and Thatcher uh, coming to power and the whole focus of the government changed um, globally because here we had, you know, all of a sudden we went to global capitalism, you know, uh, free trade agreements, the role of the government began to change. Uh, it wasn't there to provide the social safety net. It was there to, uh, you know, that was to fall to the individual. Uh, social programs were being cut back in both countries enormously. But in Canada, where, you know, healthcare was at stake, we saw, you know, certainly over the last 30 years, dramatic cuts in staffing, resourcing, um, introduction, you know, privatization, you know, more and more. Uh, private clinics, pri uh, uh, most of the long-term care in Ontario anyway is private. In, in private hands. Yeah, so, so that, and, and I think it seems to me almost like it's intentional, like really allow the healthcare system to fall apart so that people will be begging for the private uh, options. And that's what seems to be happening where, you know, people who have the money can go to a private clinic um, within, I mean, there are still limitations to all of that. Our laws have not changed that much, but you know, you can go get, you can jump the queue and go get cataract surgery uh, at a private clinic instead of waiting to have it, you know, in the hospital and covered and so on. And, and so people are getting so frustrated. They're, they're saying, oh, I would, I would pay anything to be able to, you know, to get this hip replaced and whatever, rather than waiting two years or whatever, it's more now with COVID. But. And we're saying these things because this is the atmosphere in which this violence is occurring. This, this is the, the, the cauldron that's brewing here in which the public then feels um, disrespected, ripped off, you know, it sees its relatives or its, itself, um, you know, being shortchanged, uh, in, in a time of crisis, you know, people are in pain, people are, are you know, begging for healthcare services that aren't there. The waiting rooms are so packed, as Margaret was saying, you know, the emergency rooms, uh, you know, people in gurneys in the hallways, uh, the long-term care, like we knew after we did our study on violence, it was just a year before, well, actually months before the pandemic began, we knew that long-term care was going to be a disaster in Canada. We 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 knew from the working conditions that that uh, the 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 nurses and PSWs and so on and, uh, had, had talked to us about. We we said it to each other, saying, "Oh my God!" And you know, it really didn't come to the public until Canadian soldiers went into long-term care facilities because the the staff and so on was in such crisis in in, in Ontario and Quebec. That the public heard. I mean, here were these young soldiers saying these were worse conditions than they had seen in countries that they had been stationed to abroad, you know. So I think this is the context in which we have to understand why is violence so prevalent in this institution, which in many ways is seen at the heart of our social safety net. And we need a massive expose. People need to know. I mean, this is, again, I think one of the biggest problems is that it's still a dirty little secret. And until people are feel free to talk, I, I mentioned Diane Pollan's experience. I mentioned her by name. 
she's no longer working in healthcare. So she said we could use her name. Almost everybody else that we interviewed had to be anonymized. We had to give them a, a you know, a different name or whatever. Um, and th- I, I, one more story, just to, to tell you about a, a someone who was working in long-term care. She had taken a man who was in his fifties into the shower room. He had mild dementia. He was big and strong. She was alone. She got him in there. Things were going okay. She got him undressed and was going to put him in the shower. Next thing you know, he turned on her, pushed her against the wall, slammed her against the towel rod and proceeded to sexually assault her. She, she fought him. She screamed. Nobody could hear her again. You know, no way to contact anyone for help. Partly building design, partly she didn't have the personal alarm. Uh, also, there was Staffing. just not, a, there were not enough staff. Anyway, she said, like, you, you ring the call bell, the bell in the bathroom, and people would not answer it right away, the other staff, because they were dealing with other things and would think, oh, well, maybe she's just waiting for a towel or whatever. Um, she managed to push him away, get out of the room. She was so upset, just shaking. She, he had, you know, he had it just come short of, of rape. And she realized she had left this man alone in the shower room and thought, I got to go back in there. So, you know, traumatized, shaking, she went in, got his bathrobe on and got him out in the hallway and finally just, you know, collapsed. She went to her supervisor who said, uh, okay, well, I'm sorry that happened, but thank goodness you weren't raped and I'll get back to work. She said, I can't. I just mean, she had been horribly sexually abused. And, um, the supervisor was saying, well, we can't have you go home. We're short staffed. And she ended up having to go home. She could not stop shaking. She couldn't stop thinking how close she had come. Plus she was hurt. She, her back was bruised from the towel bar. She was, you know, just completely undone by the whole thing. And I mean, this is something, she was telling us a story. She broke down crying. This was a group of about five people we were talking to at the same time. Everybody in the room was crying. Everybody could identify with this. All the healthcare workers who were in there had had similar types of experiences. So it, it's not just the, you know, the punching and the kicking and the spitting. There's a lot of sexual assault. There's a lot of sexual harassment. There's a lot of racial harassment. People being, being um, called terrible names and and being, you know, just abused, abused, horribly, horribly, verbally, and emotionally abused. And those things matter too. I mean, if you, if you're being verbally or uh, emotionally assaulted, it can affect you physically. It, and plus, you know, the mental health of healthcare workers is extremely important. Why are we disregarding that as well? And this is part of when I started off with that quote, from Rebecca Solnit saying that we need to be able to talk about this. It's a way that they're controlling the situation and it also leaves people who are, have been assaulted and need to talk about it with further emotional scars. They're, it's like they don't matter and what happened to them doesn't matter. So being able to talk about it is important and, and the public does need to see this, the whole scope of violence that is going on in these workplaces against healthcare workers. And it's interesting, you made me think of a story when you talk about being racialized in that environment. My, one of my early experiences working in healthcare. So my, my first experience was working in a, uh, in a mall and then I went to you know, a, a different facility and then I ended up in healthcare. Now, some of the things that I was just dealing with there, and again, just to kind of demonstrate some of how the thinking is different in healthcare. I remember being in situations when I first started and thinking, you know, saying to my supervisor, like, why aren't we arresting this person? Why aren't we putting them in handcuffs? Like, this is what we would have done in the mall. We wouldn't tolerate this, right? But you have to endure that as a healthcare worker. Now, one of the other experiences I had happened in the emergency department where we had this individual who was, it was my first time interacting with them, but they were a, a frequent attender of the hospital. You know, and he was, he was becoming loud and belligerent. So I went to uh, talk to him and try to deescalate him, see what was happening. And then he just goes off, uh, it, first of all, you know, using a lot of really inappropriate language, but then he starts using the, the N-word, like, a lot. 
he probably said it about 30 times in the matter of uh, a minute of this outburst. And I, and, you know, and as I'm taking this in, what I'm noticing is the other, the other healthcare workers around me are just, you know, they're just kind of continuing on because I, I, I remember thinking like, am I in the twilight zone here? Does no one else <laughs> find anything wrong with this? But everybody was just so used to this in particular person because they came in all time and they talked to everybody like this. So it, it wasn't unique to me uh, by any means. But, you know, finally a nurse kind of caught on and, you know, probably saw the look on my face and she came over and, you know, offered the guy a sandwich and he, he kind of, you know, settled down from there. <laughs> but, um, but no, you, you bring up some really good points just about what people actually deal with in this, uh, in this industry. And, you know, I guess what we're experiencing now in terms of the shortages and the quality of care, it's really perpetuating the problem that was, you know, that already existed. I don't know if you know the the the, uh, the story. I think it was 2019. Time magazine did uh, the person of the year. Uh, I think it was called the Silence Breakers. Uh, it was about the women in the Me Too movement that had, you know, broke out, had voiced the the crisis, uh, you know, of, of sexual harassment at work, and uh, and the prevalence of it. And so the cover. So this is the person of the year, like probably one of the major, you know, kind of media awards given every year. And they had the picture of, I don't know, six or seven people on the cover. And one of the pictures was not of the woman's face, which it was for everyone else, but was of a shoulder, just a shoulder. That was the picture. And it turned out it was a, an American nurse uh, on the cover. And she was so fearful about speaking out that she didn't want her face shown. And to me, you know, if you don't feel safe after you appear on the cover of Time Magazine as one of the people of the year, then you really are expressing some very deep systemic crisis. And I, that really stuck with us because as we mentioned very early on in our discussion that the silencing of healthcare workers, uh, including you know security people and everyone working in the healthcare uh, field, uh, is one of the one of the reasons that this has been allowed to become so normalized that it's now just seen as part of the job. So I want to I want to real quickly put some focus on the book that you you two have recently released. So it's uh, the title is Code White. Sounding the alarm on violence against healthcare workers. Uh, really um, excited to see this uh, get out into the public to start, uh, hopefully raising some of that level of awareness. What What do you hope uh, people are going to get out of uh, your book? Well, I mean, first of all, we Margaret and I took on the book really, uh, as she mentioned earlier, as advocacy researchers. We we wanted to give voice to the healthcare workers. We wanted their stories to be heard, especially in this atmosphere in which, you know, people are frightened to speak out. We thought it was really important that their experiences be heard, not just in an abstract way, but right from their own direct experience. And so the book is, is really, you know, full of, um, you know, quotes and stories that the workers told us. And, it, and what's interesting about it is that everything that they told us about and even their suggestions about what needs to be done is echoed in scientific literature and studies around the globe. So one of the things I, I hope, first of all, is that we're helping to break the silence. Um, I think that's a really important thing. Um, and I think, you know, it helps explain the crisis that we now have in our healthcare system that's so apparent through the pandemic. Um, I also think that in the book, it, it's important and I tried to allude to that in our discussion, to understand the systemic causes of this, that it's not just, you know, an individual thing, like one person, you know, who's a little bit off doing something, you know, horrible to someone else. It, it's much deeper than that. It's so widespread. It's so prevalent that, that it, you have to look at, well, how is this possible? How is it possible that in a profession where 85% of the staff are, are women, that such violence is tolerated and normalized to be seen as just part of the job. 
So I think we try to look at the, at the systemic causes. I know they're different in the United States uh, and Canada, but it, I think as we were all saying earlier, this story is international, it's global. It's, it's, there's not a country in the world, if you go through the scientific literature that hasn't done a study or written papers about violence against healthcare workers. I mean, it's literally, it's, it, 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 it's everywhere. And I think, you know, we're hoping that the healthcare workers who read the book will feel validated and somewhat empowered. Um, we hope that the public, I hope the public will read it. It's a difficult book for people to read. Some of it's very uncomfortable. A lot of those stories are disturbing. But I think that, you know, it really does lay out what the problem is and what needs to be done. And of course, what we want to encourage is the healthcare workers to work with the public in coalitions and so on to you know start lobbying for change to you know there's some safety in numbers speaking out around all this and also power in numbers um we have recently found out that the book is going to be made into an audio book which we hope will make it more accessible to you know to more people um particularly healthcare workers who yeah, are going might, home on might, the bus might, or in their cars might, or... maybe on commute whatever be able to listen to it <clears throat> um you know, so I guess the first thing is we, you know, we hope people will read it or read parts of it or listen to parts of the audio book. And uh, it's also sort of given us a chance to do what we're doing today, which is to talk about this. So, you know, your podcast is an important part of all of this, getting the word out. Um, I think in a lot of ways, what, what we've laid out in the book is that this is a problem that can be solved with the will, with the resources. You know, we sort of lay out the roadmap for how this can be done. What's causing it? What do we need to do to get to the other side of this? We can prevent violence. We know that in Scandinavian countries, you know, studies that have been done, Dr. Pat Armstrong and her colleagues uh, from York and uh, University in Toronto have done a number of studies and found that there's something like eight times less violence against healthcare workers in long-term care in Scandinavian countries. And when she looks at what the difference is, it's, you know, they, they have the resources, they have the staff. Uh, they're actually treating people like human beings, not like, you know, they're on some sort of production line, which is what's happening now in hospitals and long-term care. Um, you know, there, there are models that we can follow. And then there are all those things that you know that need to be done, the practical things. And, and we, we also need a whole change in the way healthcare workers are seen. They need to be respected. They need to be um, asked what needs to be done. What, what can we do to make it safe for you? They talked about every, everyone universally said after they reported an incident, they'd be called in for a debriefing and their supervisor would say, what did you do to, you know, to provoke this attack? And one of them said to us, well, wait a minute, shouldn't we be asking them, you know, what have you failed to do that I ended up being assaulted? That whole idea that somehow the victims are to blame for their own victimization has to change. That's a change in thinking. That costs nothing, you know? respecting the healthcare workers, their opinions, their ideas on what needs to be done. All the ideas, as Jim said in this book, that we lay out for, for what can be done to prevent it. We heard all of those ideas from the healthcare workers themselves, and we saw them mirrored in the scientific studies that have been done and have been published. We can do this. There's a cure. There's a way to fix this. So what we need to do, I mean, we need a groundswell, right? We need, we need people working together saying this is not acceptable in this day and age. How are we allowing this to go on? We need to change this. Well, uh, Margaret, Jim, I am incredibly grateful for the work that you're doing. Uh, I am uh, very excited about your book. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to get to know you a little better. Uh, uh, and I'm deeply impressed. I, uh, I definitely hope our listeners will go out and buy a copy or two. Uh, I know, uh, I know Christmas is, is uh, over, but Hey, there's like 355 shopping days left before uh, next Christmas. So you've got some, uh, some good opportunity to jump on here uh, and uh, go ahead and knock that, uh, knock that out. Uh, for those of you that are keeping track, there's only about uh, 90 shopping days left for my birthday. So, Hey, 
we've got some opportunity here, but this is a this is an important opportunity for us to really share an excellent, cohesive, well put together argument uh, that highlights issues that we are all committed to advocating for. Uh, and I am grateful that you have put that together and grateful that you've uh, taken some time to be with us today. Thank, thank you very much for the work that you're doing. It's, yes, it's, we are grateful for that. We are grateful mm -hmm. for that. And it's very inspiring in a way to see a collaboration between American and, and uh, Canadian healthcare workers and security people that are focusing on a common problem. Uh, we could certainly use more of that in the globe, yes. that's for sure. Thank you for that. Now, for anyone who's listening to our conversation today who wants to get a copy of the book or wants to connect with you, what are the, the best ways for them to do that? Well, uh, it, certainly the book was published by Between the Lines. Uh, for those that would shop at Amazon, it's up there as well, the electronic version. The, the audio version will come out in um, March or April. Uh, March or April. Um, I don't know whether it's appropriate to give our our our, uh, our email address. Well, I think I, we can be reached through the publisher. So between the lines in Toronto, um, knows how to get a hold of us. And but they also, you know, they can sell you the book, and um, it's in a number of the bookstores as well, and some of the libraries. So it's it's getting out there. I mean, it's only recently been published, so it's you know still sort of being. Um, made available and through various venues, but yes, between the lines or Amazon. Or if any of any of the listeners that certainly know you and 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 your work, you know, want they can contact you and you let us know or whatever, we'd be glad to to, you know, to help them. Uh, and there's going to be you know reviews are coming and so on and so forth. So and and we want to know when your podcast is on because you know we'll certainly you know put it out on Twitter and other places because we want to encourage everybody to be in this dialogue and this discussion. And uh, yeah, I'm glad we found both of you. I, I did a little Googling and I did find you. So I'm going to download some podcasts. And you have his listen. birthday, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. That, that's the important part. There you go. All right. <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. I'll, I'll echo Mike's sentiment. We, we do definitely appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to have this conversation with you. And, uh, for everyone who's had a chance to listen to this, you know, we encourage you to take action, but until next time, stay proactive. Mm -hmm.